Well, welcome to a uh, speaker series. I'm Matthew Dodder, the executive director of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And we're privileged tonight to have Jennifer Risenga uh, going to talk to us about her work uh, with the Queer Birders of North America and her bio blitzes and her work at uh, San, uh, Sequoia Audubon. And um, really excited to, to hear that story, how that uh, organization uh, formed itself and how it's grown and, and what you've done, because it's simply a fantastic story. I remember, I, I think I remember the first time I met you was via email. It was years and years ago for uh, the Christmas bird count in, in uh, Santa Clara. Mm. It, and at the time I was running it and I didn't know you from anyone. Uh, I just, I was kind of newly into that job of organizing the, the uh, CBC and I was trying to recruit people. And I was doing kind of a, a crazy thing, which is putting people in places they weren't expecting to go. And I was trying to recruit new, new folks, new people that I didn't know about. And I think I asked you just kind of basically what your birding experiences were. And if you, if you for example, uh, could differentiate between the two dowagers. And, and I wanted to make sure that you were a qualified birder and you were gonna go to a good place and that I could, I could be confident about uh, your abilities, how foolish I was, <laughs> how arrogant I was to, to think that, not to, not to know you and to just to assume that you knew nothing, I could not have been more wrong. Now that was, that was, that was not as long ago as I wish it was, but it was a while ago, it was at least 10 or 12 years ago. I didn't know who you were. I know who you are now for sure. And you repaid me one time, uh, not too many years later, by inviting me on a boat trip to a company to co-lead, to be a part of the, the Gay Burgers of North America at the time. That's what it was called. And I thought, well, okay, why not? Now, I love pelagic trips. I've been on many, many, many of them. And uh, I can't tell you, in fact, uh, everybody that I met on all those boats. But I can tell you who I met on that particular boat, Jennifer, that was one of the most uh, enjoyable trips, some of the most remarkable birders I'd ever met. Uh, um, and I, so many people with so many great stories, such great friendship. It was such a wonderful experience. I can't wait to do it again. I hope that you have another event like that in the future. <clears throat> now, if you don't know anything about Jennifer, uh, let me just tell you that she is the president of the board of Sequoia Audubon. You've done that for many years. And uh, you basically began the online um, uh, site guide for San Mateo County, which you must know was a huge inspiration for our project, which is kind of the same idea, building on some of the things that I saw you develop and trying some other new ideas. And, and, and uh, I think you're continuing to evolve your site guide. And uh, I just love the fact that we're working on this similar project side by side, inspiring each other. Uh, you inspire me in so many ways. And the work that you're gonna talk about tonight, uh, the, the project, your passion for birds, your passion for, uh, for bio blitzes and community science um, it's simply marvelous. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to uh, invite you to, uh, to, to become the host here. I'll, I'll, make you the, uh, I'll make you the host. And when you are ready, take us in. Take us, tell us what you're doing. Tell us about you and the, and the story. Okay, well, first, thanks so much for the invitation. And I just want to say as president of Sequoia Audubon Society, how dearly we love you as our big sister chapter to the South and how much we have really, I think, grown closer as chapters. Um, not everyone realizes that Sequoia Audubon originally hived off from Santa Clara Valley back in, uh, in 1949, 72 years ago now. Um, but we have had times when we've been able to work cooperatively and other times when that hasn't been possible. And right now I feel we're really in a very strong place. And I thank you for helping to make that possible and for understanding the importance of our Alliance, especially right now when we have so much to protect in terms of our shared resources, 
um, and the threats of climate change and the very unfortunate threats of fire that we have had to deal with and that we will in the future. And I also want to say that um, you at Santa Clara Valley Audubon are very fortunate to have Matthew as your executive director since we had been eyeing him for some time ourselves. Um, but you got him and I'm very happy for you. Um, before I go in, uh, after that very gracious introduction, uh, before I go in all the way, I wanted to just share a little bit about um, an event that we have coming up in uh, at uh, Sequoia next week. And I would hope that some of you would be able to attend this. And this is with, um, oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, believe me, that is not the worst thing that has happened today. Um, the presentation melted down at 6.15. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, I, it's all restored now. Um, but I'm very eager to have as many people as possible enjoy the greatness that is Sherry Williamson, who is the director of the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory and the author of the Guide to the Hummingbirds of North America that's published in the Peterson series. And she will be our guest at Sequoia Audubon on June 10th, which is a week from this Thursday. And if you want to sign up for that, just go to the Sequoia um, site at Sequoia Audubon, Sequoia small dash audubon.org. And the uh, links on the front page will take you to the web sign up. And obviously you're all here, so you know how to do it. Um, but Sherry is a wonderful speaker, a great birder, someone who shares knowledge. She has wit and science and she combines them adroitly. You want to be there to enjoy her wit and wisdom and the deep pool of knowledge that she has. She is now also the director of the Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary um, and therefore hosts hundreds of birders a year when they're touring through Southeastern Arizona. So please try to get there. All right, well, first of all, happy Pride Month. It is June and this is an exciting time for gay and lesbian people um, because we celebrate the uh, 52nd anniversary now of the Stonewall Riots, which is the date in 1969 when the uh, attendees at a um, gay, lesbian, queer bar decided to fight back when the police came to arrest them for their sexuality and for their love. And so this is the month that we celebrate Pride. And it also turns out to be the very same month in which the Queer Birders of North America was born. So the title of my talk is on queer birds, um, community inclusion, but how that also leads to community building and how at least for me and many other members of QBNA, it has led to an interest in community science. Uh, it is interesting that Matthew brought up pelagics. Uh, this group has been on a number of pelagics, my favorite being the one in Mexico that was on some kind of small craft with an outboard motor. Um, <laughs> but we love doing pelagics together. And this is uh, the, the picture here on the left was from a pelagic in San Diego that uh, was taken by a few members. And the picture here of the immature greeter peewee was taken in Mexico our first day of, the, of a QBNA trip there in Chiapas. Um, and it was the first uh, peewee that I saw. And I was really looking forward to hearing that Jose Maria that I'd been hearing in my head all those years, but this was an immature bird. And so it came out something more like Jose or Josie Maria. It, it didn't sound um, Spanish at all, but anyway. Um, there's the, the greater peewee, and you can recognize my vehicle by the eBird sticker on it. Um, so anyway, there I am. Um, but let me go on here with how the queer birders of North America got started. The origin story is in the late 1990s, which now feels like a very different time. This was during the Clinton administration, which had gotten off to what felt like a good start until the don't ask, don't tell decision. And Bill Clinton, uh, that great defender of marriage, 
later saying that he was going to sign the Defense of Marriage Act, which was going to forbid same-sex marriage. And it was also a time when Bill Clinton, that great expert in all things having to do with sexuality, um, indicated that um, having oral sex was not sex. So this was a, a difficult era, again, that it started with some promise, but ended up not quite going that way. And it was also a time when I was doing a lot of traveling as a birder. And as you know, if you want to get the best birds, you generally have to go south and you generally have to go into pretty rural areas. And I was concerned about my safety because while I'm not the most visibly lesbian person out there, I'm certainly on the spectrum and I don't do a whole lot to hide my personality. I've never figured out how to do that. So I had my concerns about safety and it occurred to me, wouldn't it be nice if there were more LGBTQ birders out there and we knew where each other was? Well, of course, you're never the one to be the first one to have a great idea like that. There's always somebody who preceded you. In my day job, I'm an historian, so I know that. And it turns out that there was already a gay birding club in England, um, or I should say in the United Kingdom. Um, and the driving force behind that is a man again seen here in a pelagic, Andy Webb. And Andy was, had, had really put together a pretty good club that had managed to do some foreign travels. And along the way, he had met Mal Hodges. Mal Hodges, who you see here in the lower left-hand corner, had organized a group in Atlanta. And if you needed protection, that was probably one of the places where you would. He founded a group called Gaggle, the Gay and Lesbian Birders of Atlanta. So I had heard about Mal's group and I contacted him by email and I said, what do you think we could do a national group? He said, yeah, maybe, maybe not. He wasn't clear if he was, was ready to take that step. But he said, look, Andy's coming here for a visit and we were gonna go out to California. And I'm like, well, great, let's all bird together. And thus it happened on June 1st of 2002. So 19 years ago now, um, they came out to visit. At the time, I was actually living in Alameda County, but we came over to San Mateo County because even then I knew, I said, that's where the best birding is. So we went to San Mateo County and thanks to Andy's sharp eye, he found a Franklin's gull. The reason that they wanted to go to the coast though is they were dependent upon me to locate their marbled merlet, which I did. That was followed up though by a trip up Gazos Creek where we had a rose-breasted grosbeak and then we had a yellow-breasted chat. And after four birds like that, I would go so far as to call it a grand slam, then we had a chat, indeed. We said, what would it take to make this a national organization? And we did it. We said, okay, we're just gonna set up an email server. We're gonna call it GBNA, Gay Burgers of North America, and just go with that for now and see what happens. Well, what happened at first was simply outreach and connection. People found each other. They, we said, oh, I'm not the only LGBTQ birder in all of New Mexico or all of Georgia or all of Wisconsin. So people were finding each other regionally. But then there were also people who had some pre-existing connections. This included in particular people who were receiving some kind of scientific training and may have gone to graduate school together or been at a conference together and had found each other that way. And so I'm just gonna skip ahead to this one. The first major kind of get together was during the magic winter of 2005. Soon after the Christmas bird counts were done, it was clear that something was going on in Minnesota that winter of 0405. There was a huge <laughs> owl eruption and that included boreal owls at numerous locations, Northern hawk owls every 10 miles on the freeways, um, snowy owls at every airport. Uh, it was really an event. 
and many birders were flocking to see these owls, which are often very difficult to see, especially in the lower 48. And so five members of what we now call QBNA kind of connected on the email listserv. And a bunch of us were also like, how, you know, we like Peggy and I ended up going the next week, not the week that they were there. But the idea that we could get together at some exciting burning spot had started to gel in our minds. In 2006, I got my act together and got 14 birders out to Mount Diablo's Mitchell Canyon at the height of spring migration. Needless to say, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 species and we had a grand old time. Uh, we had a hermit warbler. I think to this date, it's my only hermit warbler in Contra Costa County. Um, and at that point, it was clear that we were ready to meet and we could do that in a way that would be, uh, in which it could be ongoing. And so there was the first meeting, which was still pretty informal in Vermont, followed by South Dakota two years later, Beaumont, Texas, Half Moon Bay, which I organized, Chiapas, Mexico, New Mexico, and then Tucson. And I'm gonna go over each of these in turn because I think each one of our get togethers illustrates something of the, the reason why QBNA have to and has to exist. Uh, they all reveal a dimension of why it makes a difference to have some identity groups, especially one like ours that has always been open to our straight allies participating. We are not a closed group in any way. We've always had straight allies and, and uh, straight members and straight uh, uh, trip leaders. So this is not a question of wanting to close things off, but it is a question of wanting there to be a place that feels like it's a safe affinity zone. And there were good reasons for this. One other little history piece here, um, which is that we moved from being an email group to a Facebook group. And that may seem just kind of, well, yeah, yawn, that's happened to a lot of people. Um, but I think it says something about the time in which we're living. And I'm gonna come back to that point in, in a few places tonight, because I think that the story of QBNA is largely a story of the 21st century. Even though it was born originally out of some of the anxieties at the end of the 20th century, when LGBTQ rights appeared to be always in danger and perhaps in danger of never getting any approval from any court system, because at that point, our record in the courts was not particularly good. But things have changed, especially have changed for the better, I would say, for uh, white gay men and white lesbians, not as much. And unfortunately, trans rights are still very much under attack. Um, this is one of my rude cats that I told you about. Yeah, they're just appearing and talking. Anyway, um, but we have seen a, a big sea change. However, what we have done on QBNA reflects a 21st century method of being social, which is that we are much more of a network than we are an organization. And I think that in being a network, that turns out to be a strength. It has allowed us to remain quite nimble to be able to take in new members, to share responsibilities for keeping things going, for sharing responsibilities, even for putting on these little mini festivals, all of that has continuously been changing. Um, anyway, I'm presuming that you've all used your best birder manners and already read my little joke embedded in the picture. Okay, so Vermont in 2007, our first get together. And this was just a revelation to all of us that there were so many of us from all around the country and that we could work together whatever our birding levels. Matthew made reference to this in his introduction to me when he mentioned 
the high skill level of a lot of the birders on the pelagic with the, that he was a leader for. And we found out almost immediately in our QBNA meetings that we had some of the top birders of the United States who were out LGBT people. It was really quite amazing how many were. And that meant that we had this not just our own network, but networks to many other people who could be allies or supporters, but also could help us because I think you'll all know why we chose Vermont, the Bicknell's thrush. Why else do you go to Vermont in the middle of the summer? Well, I suppose there's a million reasons why you would, but if you are a birder, <laughs> you've got to see the Bicknell's thrush. And it turns out that one of our members was friends with the person who was running the Mount Mansfield banding station, Mount Mansfield up here um, close to uh, Burlington, Vermont. So included a little map there for those of you who haven't been that far back east in a while. The Bicknell's thrush used to be considered a subspecies of the great cheeked thrush. That's not an easy ID to tell it from a, a great cheeked, but it does have some range separation in its breeding season from gray, from gray cheeked. So here, what the bander did to help us was show us a hermit thrush. And the Eastern subspecies of hermit thrush, by the way, is different from our hermit thrush in some details. But you'll see here that the Bicknell's thrush lacks a clear eye ring. It's kind of an incomplete and kind of faded eye ring as opposed to the rather prominent eye ring on the hermit thrush. So even I, the only picture, unfortunately, that I had of the Bicknell's thrush in the wild from this trip was so fuzzy and out of focus that I didn't want to torment you with it. But um, we were able to actually pick them out because we were getting training from this um, scientist who was running the Mount Mansfield banding station. We also, of course, I think one of the things that we, we underestimate as birders is the way that some of the quirky little things that happen to us create the shared store of memories that are really rather precious. And we had one of those moments when we were in Moose Bog and I'll just go over there. I'll come back to that one in a moment. Moose Bog is a wonderful place for warblers, but especially for all of the Eastern Empidomax flycatchers. Um, this is the place where I saw more yellow-bellied flycatchers than at any other time in my life before or since. Um, but we're all, you can see here, it's this beautiful, lush, uh, Eastern green woodland. You know, and we're just walking through to get to the place where we're hearing the warblers and someone says, hey, what's this? And it was the collection of used bowling balls. Like, what? <laughs> where do these, how do things like this happen, right? And I posted this the other day on the, um, the QBNA Facebook page. I said, hey, look what I found when I was preparing for the talk. And and right away, someone said those bowling balls, you know, and so the, the way that you you build this group cohesion is not only because we all share the same sexuality that does play a role here because it means we can be at ease with each other in the field. You don't have to be editing your pronouns. You don't have to be worried that someone's going to attack you for being um, a, a queer person, but Ultimately, the bowling balls are neither gay nor straight. They were just a funny story that happened to us in the middle of this, of this bog. Um, and I want to just come back for a moment. Um, Doug Santoni, who is pictured here on the right, um, Doug is a good friend of ours now and is currently based in the Seattle area. He, was, uh, he has been a part of of uh, QBNA from the beginning, as you can see here. Uh, at that time, he was living in Florida. And we have spent many an hour in Florida um, chasing rarities, which of course are always present in, in uh, the lower parts of that state. And he has uh, recently stepped into being a co-organizer 
for the group um, and is helping to monitor the uh, the Facebook page. So, um, and again, many of the people shown in this picture are, are um, still very active members. Our next meeting was in the South Dakota Badlands. And we also managed to sneak into both North Dakota and Wyoming had abundant McGowan's long spurs, which is a beautiful thing to be able to say, abundant McGowan's long spurs. Um, and this is an example of how we started teaching each other about the other taxa. Michael Redder, who is the, um, I would say, principal organizer of QBNA at this time, um, and has been one of the leaders of QBNA since really since about 2009, it, it, this was the first conference he attended. He is also um, one of the editors now of, um, uh, co-editors of, of Birding Magazine and helps to put out their birding guides. He's also written the guide to the birds of Illinois and he's working on a photographic guide to the birds of Mexico. Certainly one of the most accomplished birders in North America of his whole generation. And he has been out as a gay man throughout that entire career. And again, I think that's very much a 21st century phenomenon and one that we can be proud of. So he has a great love of plants, which he has yet to pass on to me, but he also is quite proficient with the butterflies. And so we had a lot of fun with him um, here in the Badlands, because as you can imagine, there's many unusual species of butterflies different from what we see. Green comma, not that dissimilar to our satyr comma. Um, but at that time, these, this was one of the first butterflies I saw that looked like it had been cut by an origami artist. Um, and I was just so entranced with its shape that even though it's a dirt common butterfly there, I can remember feeling that first kind of thrill, similar to when you have your spark bird happen to you. Uh, and then we were also with a man named Rich Hoyer, who here is holding a plains garter snake. His father, who's also named Richard Hoyer, is one of the major um, herptologists in the United States even now. Um, and his brother is one of the um, editors of this, the guide, the online guide to snakes in California. Um, so he comes from a family where learning all the taxa made a difference. And he's not only an excellent um, birder, in fact, he's a, a tour leader for Wings, one of the preeminent companies, but he is also um, uh, someone who will do mammal tours in which he will set the, the traps in order to be able to find the small rodents even. It's not like, hey, let's go get whales at the ocean, right? It's like he's actually going for the rodents and can do it and release them alive. It's amazing. Um, so I started to, shall we say, catch the bug of being concerned about everything around you and really learning habitat. Now, you might say, I could have learned that from my own friends back in the Bay Area. And you're right, I could have. But we fall into patterns when we're with the same people all the time. And at this point in my life in 2009, 2010, I was a pretty serious lister. And I would say that bird listing and county listing was occupying a lot of my time. So if the rest of my friends were studying up on dragonflies and butterflies, I might not have known. But when you're throwing in with a, another group of people who you're friends with for three or four days, you're in a new environment, you feel at ease, suddenly things started clicking differently. And they're starting to click at just about the same moment that the community science websites are starting to come on board. Our next trip was to Beaumont, Texas in 2011. And Beaumont, of course, very close to the border between Texas and Louisiana, near the Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge, which is where most of these pictures are from. And 
you can see here an example of the kind of um, vehicle that we used. Um, and, oh no. Did, uh, okay, you didn't lose me. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't realize that if I got a phone call that would ruin everything. Um, <laughs> so hang on a second, let me just get back here. All right, so the Anyuak uh, National Wildlife Refuge it's a wonderful place. Um, and of course, Beaumont is also near to High Island, which is the site of some of the, the most dramatic spring migration fallouts. So I never thought it would happen that I would be able to get a picture of a king rail. They're very hard to see in Florida, but at Anyuak, they apparently have just decided no one's here is going to hurt us. And they're just walking out in the open. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. The American alligator here as well. We stayed at a good distance. But these are the kinds of vehicles that we would rent for all of our all of our tours. And this helped also with every trip that uh, every one of these QBNA trips, we would always shuffle the participants from one trip to another. So you would try to meet everybody in the group. And that really helped to cement some friendships as well. So the thing about Beaumont, Texas is that it's not generally very friendly territory, especially in 2011, to LGBTQ people. It's not an area where I would have felt comfortable planning to stay for five days, but there was some safety in numbers and it made a big difference. And we knew that they knew who we were and we were spending our money and loving their town and their place. And we were letting them know that. I have a lasting memory from that Beaumont trip. You know how we all can look back at those great moments in history when something happened and you remember where you were? We were all eating at like it was a Denny's or a Waffle House or something when the news came that there had been the raid um, in Abbottabad that had killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. And I remember thinking, I'm in Beaumont, Texas. I better be careful how I react. <laughs> it just, it, but again, I was with others. I felt it was okay because I wasn't alone there. There was a moment when I treasured that community and the ability to kind of work through the feelings that an event of that historical magnitude brought up, which were quite a lot. So this next one, 2013 meeting in Half Moon Bay, this was the one that I was doing the organizing for. And this is the one that Matthew remembers where I asked him to help out as a guide on the the Pelagic Voyage. And this was a particularly, um, a particularly good one for showing that straight gay alliance because I wanted it to be a good event for Sequoia as well as for the QBNA folks. We had already done a kind of, of um, draft of this by having an ABA mini festival. So we knew how to do it. But this time we got all of our local guides to help out and a lot of really strong friendships came out of that. Um, most of the local folks were not um, LGBTQ identified, um, but all of them were open-hearted and, and open-minded and indeed were welcoming. And we're really excited for the possibility to be co-leading with a Michael Redder or a Rich Hoyer. So we had a, a really good meeting of the minds. We also had, you know, just the joy of our coast. The um, we were able to teach some, you know, poor ocean-starved people from the Midwest how to do a sea watch um, and what that means. The hours of crushing boredom, followed by a few moments of excitement when you see silhouettes in the distance. Um, as well as the pelagic burning. But my friend Mel Hodges, the one who had helped me to get this whole thing started, he had found a new hobby. He had become a lichenologist. <laughs> and um, oh yeah, 
And I was like, he's communing with the trees. What is he seeing in those trees? And um, yeah, <clears throat> I think that was the beginning of a long road that I'm still on and that isn't over yet. And then we went real big. We decided to go to Chiapas. Um, it was my first time to be spending quality time in Mexico. Um, and here we had uh, the advantage of some local Chiapas based guides, um, one Mexican and one Italian Mexican, a woman who had moved um, from Italy to Mexico and become a bird guide in Chiapas. And then our guide there also uh, was able to introduce us to some local native guides who were in training to become park rangers in Chiapas. And they taught us some of the of, of their um, culture's names for the birds and some of what they knew of how the birds fit in to their mythology and into some predictions that they were able to make about weather and so on. And it, it again, this international dimension made it possible for me to see something about this openness that was possible between cultures. Um, not just negotiating American culture, but seeing it um, in this intercultural exchange. We had exceptionally good luck with owls on this trip, um, but owls bring up another element, which is nighttime safety. And here, you know, gay men and, and women are, are suddenly on an even, but frightful playing field and that um, a lot of a lot of homophobic violence takes place in the dark right and so I love the night birds but I don't always know especially in a new place if I'm going to be safe as a woman uh, um, in the dark and so being with a tour and in this case with a tour of people again where I know I can just be myself made a big difference. And I just want to say, if, you, if you've got to say windy road, why not Camino Sinuoso? I mean, isn't that just prettier? Plus, it lets you know where the word sinuous comes from. <laughs> right? it's, just, it's, it's perfect. Um, and the bird to see in Chiapas, it is Michael Redder's very favorite bird, and it is glorious. Um, the Rosita's bunting. It's blue, but it's a blue that's fading into a red, orange, yellow. It's impossibly gorgeous in the way that the painted bunting feels like a children's color in the lines bird after you've seen a Rosita's bunting. I'm not putting down the painted bunting. I do love them, but they kind of like a buffle head's head. It's all sort of segmented. The Rosita's bunting just can't decide where should the blue begin and the red end. And it's, it's magical, it's a great bird. Our next trip was to Albuquerque in February. And why do you go to Albuquerque in February? So you can drive up Sandia Crest and see all three of the rosy finches. And it, it's, it's fun. I will have to, I will admit this, is, I think the third or fourth time I've been to the top of Sandia Crest, it is just too much fun. Um, you're safe in this building that serves mediocre food and you can watch the rosy finches all day. But I want to talk here more about some of our alliances. Um, this fabulous picture of North America's very finest squirrel, the Abert squirrel, was taken by one of our um, guides on that 2017 trip, um, Angel Abreu. Uh, Angel is from the Miami area where he and his wife, Mariel, run a tour company uh, called Nature is Awesome. And Angel and, and Mariel just had their first child. Um, if you go to the Miami area, seek them out as guides, they know where the mangrove cuckoo lives. Um, but Angel was so eager to come out and work with our group. He, had, he knew many of, of those of us who were organizers in um, QBNA 
and he knew that it was just a good group to be around. But he also knew something by then, which is that we did care about all taxa. And his, his wife, Mariel, is also interested in the birds and other things as well. And so for them, it was an opportunity to really interface with a lot of, a, a lot of different uh, people with, with different expertise. And then Ash Bay, who I show here, um, they were another one of our um, 2017 guides in ABQ. And Ash now works at the Black Swamp Observatory in Ohio as a bird bander, where they get to, um, I guess, you know, make kissy faces with warblers, which is a nice, a, a nice thing to be able to do. But Ash has been a very visible voice for trans for trans visibility within our group, and within the birding community, and I believe is is really one of the the best educators on this issue out there. So I urge you to seek them out and, um, and, and have an opportunity to discuss that because it, it makes a difference that all of the LGBTQ um, perspectives are out there. This was one of the biggest meetings we've had, um, as you can see from that happy picture of all of us as a community. Um, this was uh, definitely one of the most successful meetings we had in terms of getting all the target birds, but also seeing a wide variety of habitats from the Bosque del Pache to uh, Sandia Crest um, and into some of the um, conifer woods in New Mexico as well. New Mexico is amazingly varied and it is not a very expensive area to travel in. So I, those of you who haven't yet been um, it's a wonderful trip. Often we would have an evening wrap up like you would have on a tour. And here we had a few of the leaders who were helping us were associated with grant tours. Um, and so we would, uh, we would do the countdown of what birds were seen by the various um, groups who were out. Um, sometimes we would have a presenter. Um, and then we also of course would have food. Um, and indeed the food is talked about at all of these meetings. Um, and there is a great deal of, of concern that we have a fun place to eat and you can see it there. And you know, I have to admit, maybe I'm just being post COVID nostalgic here, but the idea of like sitting down at a table that close to that many people and sharing food, it feels so transgressive. Um, <laughs> but I, I look forward to doing it again. So that's a little look at the trips we've taken. There's a, a hoped for trip to Panama that has been delayed due to COVID. Um, so you can get on the bus for that if you are not, um, they, again, not all the dates have been settled, but if you join um, QBNA on Facebook, you can get the information about it. But I just wanted to take a moment to, to wax a little bit philosophic. I think I have the time to do that. Yeah, um, which is, why does any of this matter in a bigger sense? And how does it tie in to community science? What does that mean? So I wanted to start with one of my favorite books, um, Bruce Bogomil's Biological Exuberance, which was published in 1999. It's right about the same time that we're getting QBNA underway. Bogomil's book is huge. It's about 800 pages long. And it's divided into two parts. The first part, about maybe 200 of those pages, is an essay about what he found while doing the research for the book and how he was interpreting it. And then the rest of it is a kind of encyclopedic collation evidence from the scientific literature as it existed up till 1999 of all of the same sex and non-reproductive sexual behaviors that he could find. And the result was that over 500 species of animals from the insect kingdom right up through the mammals had evidence of extensive same-sex or non-reproductive sexual behaviors. 
This included numerous birds. And he was on to the gay penguins long before they became a thing and became their own book and so on. Um, the picture I have here of uh, uh, two male king penguins who were given an abandoned egg, um, hatched it and raised it. Um, this from uh, Denmark's zoo, where they were the first um, same-sex male king penguins to hatch and raise a chick. Um, but Bogomil was onto all of this much earlier. He then analyzes what is it that sexuality is really about? What is all of this sexual behavior in which we engage? And he said, there's a lot of stuff involved in sexuality. Clearly there's intimacy. There could be a kind of group cohesion that comes out of it. Even if that's a group of two, that's dyad cohesion, I suppose, but there's cohesion. There's pleasure. There can also be aggression. There's vulnerability in the same way that when we, when we play hard with each other, there's a vulnerability, but there's also a trust that enables that vulnerability. And then there's also reproduction. And he said that from his study of all of the behaviors that have been documented by scientists that could be interpreted as being sexual behaviors, only about 15% of them, 15%, one five, had as their clear goal reproduction. And he said, okay, if we're taking a Darwinian perspective, that would make reproductive sexuality the least efficient system in nature. So maybe we need to be thinking about sexuality as being much more multifunctional rather than single functional. And as he pointed out, and as anyone who has ever watched dogs in a dog park knows, there is nothing unnatural about queer behavior. Plenty of animals engage in it. All it takes is your willingness to observe that. So the fact that humans do too would not come as a surprise, um, except for those who are ready to be shocked. But as I say here, nature has no such qualms. So he says, in terms of trying to show what sexuality is really about and trying to show that queer is normal, he says, first of all, there's the statistical argument, the one I just made about the 15%. Then there's just this preponderance of evidence. Whatever animal kingdom you look at, we see that there's same sex and, and non-reproductive um, sexual behaviors. However, the problem enters in, in number three, which is that the scientists themselves were homophobic in their reporting of non-reproductive sexuality. And he cites a number of really humorous examples of the kind of shame or diffidence or turning away that the scientists would do when they came to same-sex behaviors in animals. One scientist who had seen male-male matings of butterflies in South America referred to this as moral decay in the butterfly world. I kid you not. Um, another one upon another scientific report on witnessing female cats engaging in um, mutual sexual stimulation referred to it as a greeting behavior. Um, I have never been greeted that way. <laughs> it's, it's not a first date kind of thing. Um, now, all of this is to say that the evidence was there all along. It was our social screening that kept us from seeing it. While Bogomil's focus was on sexuality per se, a lot of trans scholars have found a similar uh, kind of cline of gender identities 
in the animal kingdom. So the same thing, what this means is that the argument from nature that was made by both religious people and simply secularly homophobic people has no basis in reality that it's very easy to disprove. And I'm gonna come back to why that's important in a moment. But if we look at the title of his book, he calls it biological exuberance. And that word exuberance, you think of someone who's exuberant, they're full of energy, they're excited about things and they're cheerful. And I love this title because it builds a bridge between the exuberance we feel when we're in love with someone and the exuberance that many of us as birders and naturalists feel when we're in the field and we see something extraordinary. And we see something for the first time. As I like to say, any day with a life bird is a good day by definition. It's exuberant every time. So being a scholar, I went back into the etymology. Exuberant is something that is overabundant. It's superfluous or extraordinary. It's related in its root to be fruitful. I'm sure some of my LGBTQ friends are ready to be fruitful. Um, it's actually related to the word for utter. Now the lesbians are getting on board too. <laughs> Right? Um, and so what Bagamil says is that our sexual expressions are as much about the extra energy that we have. They're part of this simple joy, energy, and excitement of being alive. Um, and that's part of what we can share. So why is it that I think it's important that Bagamil and others have removed the underpinnings of the false argument from nature, the idea that, well, the animals don't do that. Well, yeah, in fact, they do. And when you think about the general birding public, the general birding public tends to have either academic smarts having had educational privilege or they have local habitat smarts. They know their place very well. They know their location. They know their animals, their plants. All of this is because it is possible, just like those scientists who are worried about moral decay in butterflies, it is possible for birders to be homophobic, to be racist, to be sexist. But, more than the average community, I think birders are susceptible to reason. I have become deeply worried that America um, is not susceptible to reason, but I think that birders as a sub-community are. And so I have found that even in some birders who were initially a little like, not scared off by my being lesbian, but not sure how to handle it, have come around. And I'm watching the same process happening again with my transgendered friends in Burton. And I think it's an advantage in our community, but there's another big advantage that we have. And that is we have an active and actual living gay straight alliance all the time. As I mentioned earlier, in QBNA, we have always included our heterosexual friends and allies. We've never been an exclusive group. And we have been helped by some major straight figures in the birding community who have been our allies. Outstandingly, Ken and Kimberly Kaufman, shown here at the Florida Keys Hawk Watch, was the best picture I could get of the two of them being, well, exuberant because they'd probably just seen half of the, of the uh, broad-winged hawks in a, that ever come to North America, right? So anyway, there they are being exuberant, wonderful couple. And of course they do such good work for the birding community. And one year at the biggest week in America, uh, biggest week in American birding in early May at Black Swamp Observatory, they 
personally sponsored a QBNA QB, QB night at the festival. That was the year that, that Peggy and I went, many other members of QBNA went. And then last year, they put out this t-shirt that I'm wearing, the Bird On t-shirt from Black Swamp Observatory. They didn't have to do that. Ken Kaufman's fame is made, but he did what was right and understood that visibility for our community is especially important because LGBTQ people have been oppressed by being kept in the shadows. That's the particular vector of our oppression is being told, don't tell, don't say anything, don't mention your partner. And so the visibility for us is really important. It does make a difference to, to be explicitly included. And back in 2019, Jeff Gordon, the president of the ABA, came to give a talk that was co-sponsored by Sequoia and Santa Clara Valley. Um, and he wore a really dapper hat to the occasion, as you can see. <laughs> Yeah, and he... Matthew, wanted... you're wearing that same shirt right now. Oh, my. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No, I don't think so. Oh, well, it's it's a similar, <laughs> similar shirt. That's too good. Yeah, I, I all right. <laughs> so what I was going to say, though, is that one of Jeff's keynotes was that we are underestimating the strength of the birding community as a community. Now notice that he's saying this in October, 2019, when none of us knew the, the uh, wave that was about to hit us with COVID, right? We, we didn't know that our community was going to have to figure out how to work Zoom um, and how to do virtual field trips and you know a million other things that we've, we've all improvised pretty well in the last year. But he said that we don't, that when we think about who we admire in the birding community, we admire the Ken Kaufmans who can identify anything that flies and who knows how to how to you know write the field guide books? We admire the people who can, you know, uh, explain how you tell a rising third-year Western gull uh, that was born in Vancouver from one that was born in San Diego. <laughs> it's like, whoa, that's good birding. But what about those people and those moments in birding that are about our shared joy? And he even said that they were gonna change how they were doing photographs in the ABA publications. Instead of always showing you a close-up of a bird, they were gonna show you people looking at the bird because that's part of why we bird is for that excitement of sharing those moments. And so he highlighted a few areas. How do we spark others to notice birds? How have we kept an organization like the ABA going for 50 years? Or in my case, Sequoia going for 72 years? Or in your case of Santa Clara Valley, your organization going on 75 now? And, and even more, right? You were from the 19th. We're, well, we're close to 100 now. You're close to 100, yeah. Not even slowing down. Very impressive. <laughs> um, and then the ability to get people to connect to nature, but also to connect people through nature so that people find each other and that that will cultivate the love for the planet, for nature that we need to get through this environmental crisis that we've placed ourselves in. And I realized as he was saying that, that not only did it resonate with me, but that I knew what he was talking about because I had lived it through QBNA, both as somebody who had helped to spark the organization and keep it going, but also as someone who got all of that back. It all came back to me as well. It wasn't just me giving it to others, but I was getting it from others. And that's why I think there is this link to community science. Those of you who know me know that I am deeply committed to both eBird and iNaturalist. I keep an eBird list every day and I keep an iNaturalist at least one entry per day. I'm now at 
1,149 days in a row on eBird. Um, I'll never catch Ted Floyd. He's over 10,000, but that's okay. But I'm deeply committed to these projects because I think that they are something new that has a potential to both inspire people, but also to document what, what's happening. Whether what's happening is just a little blip and our planet is going to go on happily after a tiny crisis, or whether we are witnessing something apocalyptic. I still think that documenting it is a little thing we can do to give back for all of that exuberance we get in nature. The Queer Birders of North America was created as an email group. It then kind of morphed into Facebook, which of course hadn't really, there was nothing that was the real equivalent of Facebook in 2002 when we got started. But we morphed into Facebook because it was friendlier to photos and things like that. But then we built a community and we built it both ways, actually three ways. The community was built face to face in those meetings that we had every two years but also in little local clusters that started to grow up in different parts of the country. Deeper friendships like the ones that we formed with Doug Santoni and Michael Redder, John Mann, who I didn't have any, any pictures here, who we would go to see on other vacations. So we would have both the big confabs and we would also have these little local events. And then we'd also be meeting virtually online all the time. So the community had many different levels at which it existed, which I think makes us a network rather than a highly formal organization. We don't have a budget. We don't have a president. We just have people who are willing to do the work for a time. I don't think this group would exist without the current social media environment. We are a product of the communication technologies of the 21st century. Let's parallel that now to the growth in community science. eBird was just taking flight in the early 2000s. And from 2006 on, every QBNA event has had eBird lists that have been shared. But as I hope I documented through the photos here, from the very first QBNA shared events, it was obvious that we were cultivating interest in other taxa, that we were all learning from each other to care about the plants, the butterflies, the lichens. I can remember when I was organizing the Half Moon Bay event and I got a, a message from one of our members in Massachusetts where he said, I need the, the herp list for your area. And I need to know which ones I can easily see. And I'm like, what's a herp? Help me. You know, it's like, but what did I do? I went out and learned and I cobbled that list together in plenty of time. And the list now resides as part of my San Mateo County birding guide of the, the, the herps of, of San Mateo County. So the members shared their passion and then as iNaturalist started to emerge as the major photo sharing documentation for all taxa, including birds, but, but really everything, um, that started to percolate through the community. And I will admit to being the dealer who was handing out that drug, um, but it has really started to help people to learn the different, uh, what, whichever taxa is most appealing to them. And I think it's been a great learning tool for that. So as I see it, we're, we're, we're deep enough into the 21st century now. And boy, has it been tumultuous, right? I mean, it, it feels like it's been a pretty wild roller coaster ride from the viewpoint of history. But we're deep enough in now that we can start to detect some of the ways that the 21st century is different from the 20th century. And I would put it to you that the emergence of community science has reshaped how we bird. Many of us think about the eBird list now and about getting good photo documentation of rarities in a way that was 
extraordinary and not at all common for birders to be thinking that way in the year 2000. We also now can all participate in generating things like a breeding bird atlas. We can all be making notations of the birds that are breeding. That's an ability we all have on our, on our cell phones, right? With your eBird list, you can now put the breeding code right in there. So there's been a democratization of knowledge gathering that has been a major part of the 21st century, for better or worse. But I think for us as a birding community, it has been for the better. We are all engaged in lifelong learning. Our brains are sharp. We won't need crossword puzzles when we turn 80 because we're playing a crossword puzzle all the time called birding, trying to understand range and status, migration patterns. So much that each of you knows as a birder. But QBNA was doing a different kind of work too. It was doing a very quiet political work. When we would go to Beaumont, Texas or the Badlands as a group of 40, 50, 60, rather rambunctious LGBTQ birders, we were, we were making a statement that we, we just love being here. We love being in, in your community. We're, we're here to enjoy the same nature that you enjoy every day. And I think that those little visits normalized LGBTQ existence, not that our group did alone, but many trips like that, many daily encounters like that have created something of a sea change. And in the same way that QBNA provided LGBTQ people around the years, you know, to a 2006 to 2018, a certain amount of protection in a dangerous world, I think now we have the strength to give that protection to our, our uh, trans brothers and sisters as they are finding a lot of the fury of the world turned against them. And so, so these are still important structures, but some of the story that I'm telling right now is one of progress and change, not because that change is irreversible. I'm a dialectician, Any, anything can be reversed, but it is real progress. It does feel different. And I'd like to think that we can continue this and make the world even better. And you know, it might've been this moment when Rich Hoyer, my dear friend was coming at me, offering me a snake. <laughs> he just picks up snakes like it's nothing. But what was it that we did that worked? We were created to make LGBTQ folks feel at ease in the field together. But it was that ease was not just, oh good, I'm not gonna get you know, knifed by somebody. It turns out that the ease did something else. It created an openness to share. That when you're really yourself, you don't hold back. And so we shared our wonder and our curiosity about birds, but also beyond birds. And the fact that we had these exceptional field naturalists in the group induced people to find some of these things interesting. And then you tie in the other 21st century piece, which is social media, community science, and digital photography. It made the spread of the curiosity and exploration much more efficient than it would have been in the 20th century when you would have had to go to these 800 page compendiums of every taxa and spend time figuring out the keys. It's a lot faster now. And then all of it would get greased every two years, spurred along by the in-person meetings. So I'm hoping that I've at least induced some of you to consider um, joining our Facebook group um, and appreciating the discussions there, the photos. People will post sometimes a political post about something that's happening. Our group has been involved in discussions around say whether we should boycott um, countries 
that have passed anti-gay laws or whether we should use our privilege as first world people to try to change those laws. That's true from one state to another too. Um, what, what should we do in terms of uh, making our presence known? Um, there are sometimes uh, people will, will uh, simply share sightings from their local area. Um, anyway, it's just a, it's a fun Facebook group and we would love you to join us. And I've, I've put down the non-intuitive number there so you can write it down. Um, I don't know it by heart either, but if you put in QBNA, it comes up. By the way, we changed our name from GBNA to QBNA at that Albuquerque meeting. Um, we felt that um, the gay label had always been a little bit exclusionary anyway, and that queer was the larger term, but I'd be more than willing to handle that um, as a question if anybody wants to know more about that decision. But I hope that I've inspired you to ask some questions yeah. and to follow up on anything that was of interest to you and what I said. And thank you very much for this opportunity. It was a lot of fun to prepare this. Oh, absolutely, Jennifer. Um, why don't you hand back the controls when you have a second? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And um, you want absolute power for Matthew. OK. <laughs> um, I wouldn't put it that way. Oh, all right, all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, the power is yours. Well, we're uh, going to let people enter some questions in chat. I know we already have some questions, but I, I, I think after that really moving uh, closing that you gave, that there are going to be some more questions coming in. But I have a couple things I'd like to say sure. uh, before we get into that. Um, you and I have something, we have several similar, uh, similar things in our backgrounds. Uh, a long love of nature and birds for one. Mm -hmm. Background in divinity, obviously another one. It's one thing that drew me to, toward you and you to me. Um, but I think what you have done and what the community is doing is expressing uh, a, just a, a combined love of people and of sharing and of learning and of community and of teaching. And uh, you have done all those things. You've built uh, a, a huge network with the help of Michael and all the other folks who were part of that history. It's truly remarkable. And I just have to congratulate you on that because it's, it's really something amazing. And you know, I'm not at all surprised that it took off the way it did. I mean, in my, in my class, uh, I saw a growing number of LGBT community uh, members join the class. And I believe it's because um, we all shared the love of birds for one thing, but it was a very safe, a safe place where we shared that love. And that is truly something I, I noticed on the boat when I was, was on the pelagic trip with the community. And I noticed it in the field every day and I've noticed it in my own class. And I notice it with you. Uh, for sure. So anyway, I, I just love what you had to say. Uh, your, your strength of building alliances is so important right now, especially now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all that work. No, you're welcome. Now, I wonder if uh, Barry or Carolyn, uh, you might have had a chance to kind of sort through and find some questions there that we can ask uh, Jennifer. Yeah. Allison wanted to know, does the Queer Birders uh, have an Instagram account? We do not right now. We would be delighted if someone wanted to volunteer to set that up for us, because um, we need it. Um, I have to say that uh, maybe it's my poor photographic skills or something, but I didn't take to Instagram. Um, I say I'm a humanities professor. I like text. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so it was, it was a little too visual for me as a learner, um, but it would be wonderful if we had one. Um, and I, I know there, we, so many of our, our uh, members on the Facebook page are artists and excellent photographers, and they would probably appreciate that. So it's, it, I'll put it on my agenda, um, not to do it, but to get somebody else to do it. One of the many yes. things on the agenda, I bet. Exactly, yes. Um, there was another question uh, from Steve. How do you handle non-birding partners or spouses? Is it an active effort to convert them to birding? Um, we, you know, we, we don't want to interrupt whatever delicate ballet the uh, partners are doing. Uh, if you have, a, you know, it, it's like an interreligious marriage, right? I mean, it, it, there's just some non-negotiables there. But no, we, we have taken the non-birding spouse into account. 
and with each one of the of the um, the trips we've taken, we set up some kind of cultural events that are nearby and that they can get to easily. And if possible, we even have arranged transportation. Um, so, you know, museum and uh, cultural events and so on. But what we found is that often the partners want to go around partially because they they've heard of some of these areas like Bosque del Apache is kind of world famous for the sandhill cranes, right? And it's like, you know, okay, that's a big charismatic bird. I suppose I can get into that with you for a while, you know, and then the scenery is nice. And so we found that even a lot of the non-birding spouses are willing to go along. They just don't get quite as, uh, you know, enthused as the birding partner does. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but for the most part, we have tried to do that. Now, because of the era in which we got started, we didn't have people who were coming with children. I would think that when we are able to resume these trips after COVID, there will be more couples who have children. And that would present a, a very different challenge. And I won't be organizing that meeting. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how graciously that person can handle it when, when uh, that falls to them. Um, that completes the chat questions, unless somebody has one they'd like to chime in. There were a couple chat comments I just wanted to point out. Mm -hmm. uh, one was from Diego Calderon Franco saying, nothing is more queer than nature, which I thought was a great comment. <laughs> he also said saludos from Colombia. So we have uh, an international audience tonight. Very nice. So that was really cool. Yeah, so Diego, um, I, I'm very honored that you were, that you, that you came. It, it, it's, and I certainly hope to get to Colombia sometime soon. Absolutely, absolutely. It would be a pleasure, guys. Absolutely. <laughs> that would be you, amazing. You look, like, you look like a beautiful feline there, Diego. Um, <laughs> There's a jaguar. There's a jaguar from Pantanal, not, not one of your kittens. Yes. <laughs> Oh, so Jennifer, I wanted to point out that Steve Pat, who I can see on the upper right of my screen, kept an eBird list uh, during the talk because you presumably you're right by a window, Steve. How many birds did He's you end up outside. logging? Outside. Just, just, just six, but some good ones: wild turkey, white-breasted nuthatch. <laughs> oh, great! Those are the, those are the highlights. There, there's another eBird uh, devotee for you. Yes. Yes, this is and and uh, we today this morning when we did this presentation uh, or a version of this presentation from Hillier Park in conjunction with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, um, Carolyn and I had thirty seven species. Oh, wonderful! So one. that was very good. You know, you you mentioned uh, how you kind of um, started uh, exploring other taxa uh, as part of uh, as part of the community. And uh, I have fallen into that as well because, uh, of course, I began with birds. Uh, then, I, uh, then I adopted dragonflies because, you know, they're basically like birds. Uh, <laughs> they're smaller. <laughs> Except, yeah, well, so anyway. That's why you need binoculars that can focus close as well as far. Right. So dragonflies, yeah. uh, butterflies, uh, trees. Mm. I'm very deeply into trees. I am not into lichen yet, but I'd be willing mm. to be convinced. But mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when we're going, we're getting ready to go on a trip to the Sierra, and we have a book box, and it has all the books in it. Of course, we've got iNaturalist as well. We'll be taking pictures like crazy. But that is absolutely part of this whole process of meeting people, learning from them, and adopting their interests and their passions as well. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I feel that very strongly. And I, I imagine that that you have had him speak to your chapter too. Uh, but John Muir Laws oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Has, absolutely. has used this as a principle. He says that every birder should learn at least one other taxa. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning that he gave was that in any group, there is a different pace of observing nature. And he said, the lichen people don't even leave the parking lot. Right. And a little <laughs> light bulb went off in my head like... <laughs> When you get older, sometimes you get mobility restrictions. I could do that. <laughs> yes. I have a feeling that's a long way off. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping. But but you know, it, learn it now, yeah. and then when you need it, it's there. What yeah. I noticed about the the uh, dragonflies, of course, is that you know when it gets hot and it gets really sunny midday, 
when the when the birds kind of slow down and become mm -hmm. a little less obvious, the dragonflies come out. So it's basically continuous activity for someone who adopts more than one taxa. <laughs> right. It can be. Yeah, right. You can you can use different parts of the day for different reasons. The other thing that I found though, which is very interesting to me, is that when I am slowing down, and as Carolyn said, a hike with a naturalist is a crawl, and that's true, um, is that if I am, say, studying some lichens on a tree for a few minutes, the birds sense that I am so out of my mind that I'm no threat to them, and they start making more noise. And I start to hear more birds in the environment than I had before. And if you had just asked me to stand still for five minutes to make that happen, I would have been bored and shuffling my feet or whatever. But instead, I'm really intent on that tree. And then I hear the olive-sided flycatcher, or then I hear the hermit warbler. <laughs> and so it's been helpful that way. Um, and it hasn't hurt my birding, except that I can get a little impatient with the third rectress of a gull. But <laughs> maybe that was before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it is it is part of the of the moment in which we're we're living now. I mentioned this in my earlier talk today that part of what I find very cool about the lichens is that they are a three-way symbiosis of um, algae and fungi and bacteria. And all three partners end up living far longer than they would individually. And in many cases, you know, essentially as long as there is moisture in the environment. So with, if you think about that, the lichen becomes this kind of living diversity within itself. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get Trinitarian nice. because I'm not a Christian, but it's <laughs> almost like three and one, you know. <laughs> it's a magic number. <laughs> now there's a union. The 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 uh, the yeah. union of these life forms creates something mm -hmm. new uh, and recognizable. And and the, the the little bits that I can understand of the really advanced lichenologist, they like some of the people doing DNA. The advanced lichenologist think that the species concept might not fit for lichens at all, actually. Yeah, I, it, it certainly seems that way. Yeah. Quite interesting. So and yes, we, Ginger, I'm, I'm glad to hear about that, that yeah, the Native Plant Society, yeah, when you, when, when you can't do the sea watch anymore, the plants will still be there right up to the coast, so <laughs> good <Right>. strategy. <laughs> do we have any more uh, questions, Barrier? Uh, Steve has a comment. Uh, Steve has uh, I just wanted to say something about getting getting excited and getting people excited. Jennifer talked a lot about you know some special rare birds of different places in the in the world and lifer birds and so on. But uh, just yesterday, I posted. I think most of the people here are probably members of Silicon Valley Birding on Facebook, very popular. And just yesterday, I posted some pictures of two baby. Uh, actually one, sorry, a uh, uh, baby house finch with his hair standing up on top of its head. And that picture got more likes uh, from Silicon Valley birding than any other picture in the, in the last several weeks and so on. Even, even though some people on that group post some fabulous, fabulous pictures, uh, yet it was that picture which got the most interest. And it just goes to show that, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, some pileated woodpecker, which gets everybody excited. It can be some very ordinary things um, that people can appreciate. Amen. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Yes. There is something that, that you know, it, that older birders give as advice to new, to new birders, which is learn the common species. And it turns out that, that that's really good advice for a beginner but that it repays benefits as you start to notice more about behavior, the life cycle, like Steve was pointing out, um, you become more attuned. And I say that there's always a difference in my mind between the birds I've lived with and the birds that I just know because when I go birding somewhere, I see them. So there's a small family of violet green swallows that is nesting in the eaves of our next door neighbor. And now I can say I've lived with the violet green swallow. I can hear them every morning. 
I, I can be asleep and I can be hearing them and I know that's the violet green. It's not a tree swallow anymore. I've been able to make that oral distinction because I've lived with the bird. And that that's, to me, that's really, that's really fun. You know, and it's a deepening of knowledge that's already there. Absolutely. This is what Julie does. <coughs> Ginger, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, you, are, you all need to mute. So I don't echo. Oh, I'll mute, sorry. <laughs> this is what Julia Amato does with the Backyard Bird Program with, uh, with our Audubon Society, where she focuses on the things that are um, in our backyards every day. Uh, brown towhees, or, sorry, I'm old. Uh, California towhees. And uh, the, this month's uh, uh, backyard bird is the, the morning dove. It's such a basic bird, but there's so much to learn about it if you sit and watch and, and live with it and enjoy it. It's, it's mm -hmm. the fact that all the guys wear a lot of eyeshadow and are very metrosexual, but you know, it, that's, that's how that species works. So there's a beautiful iridescence on the, the neck of an adult morning dove. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's kind of a, kind of a good segue. I wanted to remind uh, everybody who isn't a member of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society that our, our uh, uh, summer newsletter just came out. And if you, uh, don't receive it in the mail. It's available online on our website. We've got all kinds of, of, of things going on at our local chapter, as does Sequoia. And I really look forward to having you come back, Jennifer, uh, and speak again at some point and uh, for us to do more work together. Yes. The, uh, the, uh, the, the things that our chapters have done together, the talk um, uh, with uh, Birding Magazine, and uh, and on uh, and uh, the uh, Half Moon Bay mini birding event that we did uh, years ago, and the pelagic trip uh, with the QBNA, it's all wonderful stuff. And I, I really so look forward to having us do more things like that together. Um, so I want to thank you again for coming tonight. This was marvelous. Uh, say hello to Peggy, of course, who I saw earlier, but I can't see her now. Um, and uh, thank you everybody else for coming this evening. Uh, this will be, is being recorded right now. I'll take out all my, my, my mumbling at the beginning and end, uh, but it'll be posted on the website and, and Jennifer, you'll be able to, to uh, share it with your, uh, with your chapter as well. So thank you everybody for coming. Enjoy your evening. Salud. Uh, and uh, get out there and enjoy the birds and the other facts as well. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>